10 to 10, I've been talking about tinnitus uh, or uh, ringing in the ear on the show uh, today. Apparently 10% of us experience it. Uh, there's even more demand now. Now, uh, to meet that demand, there's a new clinic for people who suffer from it uh, in Cheltenham. Mark Williams is the principal audiologist at the Cheltenham Tinnitus Clinic. Uh, you hear a little bit more about the centre uh, later on, but what is it? Well, tinnitus is but a word, really, to describe any non-verbalised auditory hallucination that people experience. Uh, it can take the form of a tonal illusion, uh, being ringing, buzzing, whistling, humming, or indeed what you're describing, which is an atonal uh, perception, uh, which is typically uh, a little less, as the name suggests, uh, is not so note-like. It's uh, more of a bandwidth of sound, often described as a rushing, a shushing, or a hissing. Um, there is also a musical uh, variation uh, where people People have the well, people experience repetitive uh, musical uh, uh, components over and over again. Um, the the basis the basis of it in, in all of us is uh, is hearing loss. And what uh, what you will find is that the pitch uh, of the tinnitus will correlate with the hearing loss that has been acquired. Uh, so low pitch tinnitus, deep rumbling uh, tinnitus, low frequency hearing loss, and vice versa. Is there a typical profession where you're more likely to be affected by tinnitus than, than, than another? And I'm immediately thinking of a pneumatic drill or someone who plays the drums. Absolutely. We do know that there is a correlation between uh, tinnitus experience and noise exposure, uh, primarily because noise exposure certainly brings about hearing loss at a, at a faster pace. The, uh, all of us as mammals uh, have the, the uh, disp predisposition to lose hearing as we go through life. So really anybody who's over the age of 30, does have some degree of high frequency hearing loss. We lose the high pitch hearing first and that process uh, spreads to the lower frequencies as we go through life. However, if we, uh, if we are exposed to loud noises or we have the misfortune of, experience certain, of experiencing certain pathologies or conditions, this can speed the process up. So if you do have uh, the predisposition towards developing tinnitus, you're much more likely to experience it at an earlier age if you're exposed to loud noises. And it's a, it's a sense, hearing is a sense that is incredibly important in our daily lives and, and something which affects our our balance, our just everyday activities, isn't it? You're quite right. Um, the the hearing organ and the balance organ are co-linked. They happen to share the same space in the temporal bone. Um, but the reason the reason why most of us experience tinnitus as being some kind of high frequency or high pitched uh, perception is because the the sound that we experience correlates with the hearing loss, and the vast majority of us lose our high frequency hearing uh, to a note degree but the importance the importance of it uh, as a as a as a sense uh, is it cannot be understated from the point of view that it is really one of the few uh, sensory mechanisms that we possess that give that gives us an overall ambient awareness and of course there are certain times when you notice you're hearing more than others and, and certainly for me it's the moment just before I go to sleep or the moment I wake up and it's very quiet uh, and certainly for me, that's the moment when I hear the shell up to the ear, if you like. Absolutely. Our, our auditory systems or hearing systems have a, an internal volume control, if you will. Um, and this can fluctuate throughout the course of the day. And it's influenced uh, primarily by two things. One is emotional state. So if we're anxious or frightened or upset in some way, the auditory sensitivity tends to go up and people notice that tinnitus elevates at that moment as well. But equally, as in your case, when you're in a quiet situation for a protracted period of time, as in just before bed, where there is no external environment, um, the system will become more sensitive. Uh, the whole purpose of this system really is to keep us connected to our auditory environment. And when there isn't information coming in, the system will go hunting, metaphorically. Now, if you have an internal noise like tinnitus at that moment, it will become louder. It's like an amplifier then, isn't it? It, it is, that's correct. And it, it's interesting because it does, you'll notice, that, uh, you'll notice that when you move into a quiet situation, you will be more aware of your tinnitus because there's a greater contrast, obviously, between the tinnitus and the quiet environment. But over a period of time, if you do have a reactive auditory system that is sensitive to these changes, it, the tinnitus can become a little louder as this internal volume control starts to ratchet up. 
Now we live in a world where you see people walking along the street now, they've got their smartphone in their pocket with these big booming headphones walking along. Not only are they in danger when they cross the road because they can't hear anything coming, but you just think, do you realise what, what pressure you're putting your ears under? No, you're quite right. Um, what, uh, what tends to happen is that when we, when we are exposed uh, to noise, um, if, the, if the noise is, uh, is too loud, it, will, it won't automatically kill hair cells within the inner ear or damage the, the inner ear system, but what it starts to induce is what's called metabolic stress. So the system starts to work too hard. Um, and this, this metabolic stress or fatigue uh, starts to, is, is, a, is a cumulative. Um, and even when you withdraw the noise, there has to be a recovery period. And your hearing acuity or hearing sensitivity is reduced thereafter until the system recovers to full functionality. And you can, we'll often, a lot of us will have experienced this, unfortunately, when we've been to a, a club or a, a concert or a gig that's too loud for comfort, and we come out and we feel deaf. Uh, we really do. Now, that uh, experience of deafness after noise exposure is a sign of metabolic stress. Now, if you do that repeatedly, um, then you will actually start killing hair cells within the, the hearing organ, and the deafness can become permanent. And this is really what allows tinnitus uh, to, to, actually, to actually start. That's Mark Williams, the principal audiologist at the Cheltenham Tinnitus Clinic. More to come from him after 10. And there now we'll be talking about a new clinic for people who suffer from a hearing conditions it's called tinnitus. Uh, if you want to know the sound of it, this is, this is one of the, the, the sounds that you would get in your ear. Uh, if you were uh, diagnosed with tinnitus. You can't really miss that sound. If it's something you've experienced, I'd love you to get in contact and, and tell me about it too. 01452 uh, 307575 because a brand new tinnitus clinic's opened uh, in Cheltenham, brand new practice uh, in Nuffield Health at the hospital there. Uh, Mark Williams is the principal audiologist at the Cheltenham uh, Tinnitus Clinic. And earlier on, I talked to him about how many people have been suffering from it in recent years. And the question is, what can you actually do about it? There's two main ways currently of treating it. We unfortunately do not have a drug or pharmacotherapy uh, for this condition, although everybody is hopeful in, in years to come we will have. The two, two methods of treating it are to either try and induce uh, a state called habituation, which is when an individual, uh, when the, we try and render the noise of the tinders to be a little bit more like the noise of an individual's breathing. So it isn't something that automatically breaks through to conscious awareness. Um, and this isn't really just a case of getting used to it. It really is a case of not being aware of it. And uh, uh, we employ a number of different therapies uh, for different profiles to try and gradually bring that about. Um, this is classified uh, from our clinic as tinnitus desensitization therapy, and we may new, we may use shapeable noise generators that are set up specifically for a person's sensitivities, uh, or indeed certain types of tinnitus specific hearing aid prescriptions to induce that. We would combine that also with counselling and uh, various other psychological support uh, methods to to chivvy the process along. The other way of treating it is to try and selectively reduce hyperactivity within the hearing component of the brain. And this is what's called uh, neuromodulation therapy. And what we're doing with this type of therapy is that we're using a very specific sound stimulus uh, in order to try and reduce, because there's a bundle in, in every, everybody who experiences tinnitus uh, has a, a bundle, for want of a better way of describing it, of hearing nerve cells or auditory nerve cells within that part of the brain that are firing spontaneously when they shouldn't do. And using this technique, we try and dump, dull that down, reduce it sustainably. So we make the tinders less invasive, less salient. And if you can do that, it becomes automatically deprioritized by the system and it becomes a, hell of, a, lot, a lot easier to live with. Um, so that I mean that would be the slightly more novel way of dealing with it, and that's a treatment called acoustic uh, coordinated reset neuromodulation, um, and the sound is delivered uh, via a small wearable device that's about the size of a matchbox um, through a, a headphone system uh, that doesn't actually impede hearing. It's it, it's what's called acoustically transparent, so you can wear it in all environments, uh, whether you're 
watching television or talking or listening to music. Because I think you can have special earplugs made, can't you, for, yeah. for going to concerts? And most of us forget to do it or, you know... You're quite right. Vitally important for all of us, actually. I mean, if there's one thing that's, that uh, needs to be prioritised beyond all things is prevention. <laughs> it really is. Um, and there are a variety of, of, of very, very well-made um, musicians' uh, earplugs or filtered earplugs that allow you to go to concerts or go to clubs um, and what these will do is that they will reduce the overall volume or intensity of the signal but they will maintain the fidelity of the music and indeed the fidelity of speech so it just turns everything down a shade it isn't like putting your fingers in your ears you see you get very uh, you get a much better preserved uh, acoustic experience and just finally, how damaging can tinnitus be to, to people's lives? Can they lose sleep over it? Does it make a you know, big impact on their life? Well, the, yes, it does, unfortunately, in, in, in certain cases. Um, the reason for it, usually, is that uh, when we experience noises like this, um, we soon realise that we don't have the ability to control them or turn them off easily. Um, if someone's tinnitus is very high pitch, for example, uh, it's very difficult to mask. They can hear it above music, above speech, etc. Um, once that is the case, it develops a very negative emotional uh, context um, and that leads to negative thoughts and the the generation of, of anxiety and the problem is with this is it it will affect sleep you're quite right and when it does start to impact on one's ability to sleep it obviously impacts on our ability to work and to be functional and that's really where people do need help when that starts to happen because we can't let it really go much further than that uh, for, for obvious reasons um, and sometimes it does require uh, you know, multiple, multiple disciplinary management with audiologists, ENTs and sometimes clinical, clinical psychologists to help the process along but the important message is no matter how bad it is there's always something that can be done. And it must be very rewarding for you as an audiologist to to treat somebody and 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 you know at least to to keep it at bay. I know it can't be completely cured, but but it can be certainly treated, can't it? Well, it's a very it genuinely is a very gratifying experience personally when you have the opportunity to see somebody that has tried a variety of, of different therapies and has has, uh, has been put on antidepressants and so forth and you can give them a controlling mechanism and sustainably reduce the the the, uh, the invasiveness or the salience of, of the noise. Um, and yes, I'm I'm very privileged to, to obviously work in a job that, that provides that opportunity. That's Mark Williams, the principal audiologist at the Cheltenham Tinnitus Clinic. BBC Radio Gloucestershire, 22 minutes.